नमस्कार वोम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज वेब हैव ज्योतना श्रीवास्तव एंड विद मी इज प्रशांत कुमार सिन्हा ब्रिंगिंग ग्रिम्स ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस India's first COVID vaccine for children above 12 years, Zykov D, gets approval for emergency use in the country. Prime Minister Narendra Modi says Zykov D vaccine approval is a testimony to the innovative zeal of India's scientists. Sri Lanka enters day two of nationwide lockdown as government battles surge in COVID cases. External Affairs Minister of India Dr S J Shankar speaks to German counterpart Heiko Maas over the situation in Afghanistan. German Chancellor Angela Merkel meets Russian President Vladimir Putin in the backdrop of one year of Alexei Navalny's poisoning. India's Amit Khatri wins a silver medal in men's 10000 meter race walk at the World Athletics Under 20 Championships. And in football, Liverpool cruise to a 2-0 win over Burnley in the Premier League. As the nationwide free COVID-19 vaccination campaign and government facilities for those above 18 years is underway, we advise our young listeners to get vaccinated and to help others get vaccinated. We also advise our listeners not to lower their guard as COVID-19 remains a threat to our health. Please stay at home unless it is essential to go out and continue to follow these three simple steps. Wear a face mask, maintain 2 gaz ki doori for social distancing, focus on hand and face hygiene. For any covid related information and guidance contact national helpline numbers 0112397804680475 and, and now the news in detail India Central Drug Standard Control Organization CDSCO has approved DNA COVID-19 vaccine Zykov D of Kerala Healthcare for restricted use in emergency situation in India for 12 years and above It was approved after evaluation of the interim third phase clinical trial results in consultation with subject expert committee of CDSEO. The vaccine has an efficacy of 66.6% and it is to be stored at 2 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius. The vaccine is needle free to be administered intradermally and in three doses at day 0, 28 and 56. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said India is fighting COVID-19 with full vigor and the approval of world's first DNA-based Zykov D vaccine of Zytus Cadila is a testimony to the innovative zeal of India's scientists. In a tweet Mr Modi said it is a momentous feat indeed. India's health minister Mansukh Mandavia said the vaccine can be used in making the children of India COVID safe. Mr Mandavia said Zykov D is the sixth approved COVID-19 vaccine in India and the second indigenously developed one. He said Prime Minister Narendra Modi's vision of Atmanirbhar Bharat and Make in India delivers another significant accomplishment. In a significant achievement, India's cumulative COVID-19 vaccination coverage has crossed the 58 crore mark on Saturday. Union Health Minister said more than 45 crore vaccine doses were administered as the first dose and over 13 crore vaccine doses were given as the second dose so far. The new phase of universalization of COVID-19 vaccination commenced from the 21st of June this year. The ministry said more than 43 lakh 92 thousand vaccine doses were administered today. Over 20 lakh 88 thousand vaccine doses were administered as the first dose, and more than 7 lakh 36 thousand vaccine doses were given as the second dose in the age group of 18 to 44 years. Now let's take a look at the coronavirus updates from around the world. Sri Lanka entered day 2 of its nationwide lockdown to stem a surge in COVID-19 cases in the country. In a statement, the Sri Lankan Foreign Ministry said that given the nationwide lockdown in effect from 10 p.m. on the 20th of August until 4 a.m. on 30th August 2021, the Consular Affairs Division of the Foreign Ministry limits its services to those in urgent or genuine need during this period. Meanwhile, the Public Health England stated that the Euro 2020 final was a super spreader event due to the level of COVID-19 infection in and around London's Wembley Stadium. The figures released on Friday said that about 2,300 people were likely to have been infectious at the time of the event. 
Vietnam will deploy army personnel to Ho Chi Minh City to help with logistics as the city of 10 million people asks residents to stay put for two weeks starting from Monday. This is according to a report on the government website placed on Friday. U.S. President Joe Biden has said that the evacuation efforts in Afghanistan is one of the largest, most difficult airlifts in history. Speaking at the White House on Friday, Mr. Biden acknowledged that the mass evacuation from Afghanistan is not without risk of loss. However, Mr. Biden added that the only country in the world capable of projecting such power is the United States. He said that the U.S. had rescued 13,000 people to date and that any American who wants to come home will get to his home. Mr. Biden described the images emerging out of Afghanistan as gut-wrenching. Replying to media queries, the president said the U.S. military would make the same commitment to 50,000 to 65,000 Afghan allies hoping to leave before adding the evacuation of American citizens was the priority. In his address, he also stated that the United States stands by the commitment made to the people, including other vulnerable Afghans, such as women leaders and journalists. Mr. Biden also said that the G7 summit will convene next week, so the nation's heads of state can coordinate a mutual approach on Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said that the U.S. operations continue to take place primarily within the confines of the airport itself, although there was one successful mission to rescue 100. 69 Americans from shortly outside the Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul perimeter. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has thanked the partner countries who played an important role to help them evacuate U.S. citizens and at-risk Afghans from Kabul. Bahrain on Saturday announced it was allowing flights to use its transit facilities for the evacuation. The United Arab Emirates said it would host up to 5,000 Afghans prior to their departure to other countries. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that so far 13 countries have agreed to host at-risk Afghans at least temporarily. Another 12 have agreed to serve as transit points for evacuees, including Americans and others. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar spoke to his German counterpart, Mr. Heiko Maas, on the situation in Afghanistan on Saturday. Dr. J. Shankar in a tweet said that he discussed the evacuation challenges in Afghanistan and the policy implications of the changes there with the German Foreign Minister. Mr. Maas in a statement said that Germany is currently entirely focused on evacuating as many individuals from Kabul as possible under the given very difficult circumstances. Germany said that it is cooperating closely with its international partners to this end. The statement added that they have reached an agreement with the United States that the Ramstein Air Base can be used temporarily for the transit of persons seeking protection who are being taken from Afghanistan to the United States. Meanwhile, on Friday, Dr. Jay Shankar met his Qatari counterpart, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani, on his stopover in Doha. In a tweet, he said that they had a useful exchange of views on Afghanistan. On Friday, the foreign ministers of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, called on all parties in Afghanistan to work in good faith to establish an inclusive and representative government, including with the meaningful participation of women and the minority groups. In a statement issued after a meeting at Brussels on Friday, NATO announced that it has suspended all support to the Afghan authorities under the current circumstances. It added that any future Afghan government must adhere to Afghanistan's international obligations, safeguard the human rights of all Afghans, particularly women, children and minorities, uphold the rule of law, allow unhindered humanitarian access and ensure that Afghanistan never again serves as a safe haven for terrorists. German Chancellor Angela Merkel met with Russian President Vladimir Putin on Friday. In what could be Ms. Merkel's last visit to Russia as German Chancellor, Germany urged Russia to communicate with the Taliban the importance of evacuating civilians from Kabul. Germany will undertake its general elections in September. Ms. Merkel called on Russia to communicate with the Taliban that there was willingness to work with the militant group on humanitarian grounds if they allowed the safe evacuation of Western Allied Afghans. Russian President Putin called on the international community to prevent the collapse of Afghanistan. The visit comes in the backdrop of the completion of one year of the poisoning of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. Mr. Navalny was taken to Berlin for treatment. However, upon his return to Russia, he was incarcerated on arrival. 
the Kremlin justified the arrest ostensibly by for violating the terms of his bail on a prior conviction. The issue of Mr. Navalny's jailing also figured in a meet between the two leaders. According to reports, Ms. Merkel asked that Mr. Navalny be freed. However, Mr. Putin denied ordering the poison attack and said that Mr. Navalny was in, po in prison over criminal offences. On the Ukraine issue, Mr. Putin asked Ms. Merkel to work towards a peaceful solution to the conflict in the eastern Ukraine. According to reports, he stressed that there was no alternative to the Minsk peace agreement. Chancellor Merkel is due to hold talks with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky on Sunday. She is reported to have said there was a stalemate and that people continued to die and hope for some progress to be made in the next few weeks. Ukraine also opposes the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia to Germany, fearing that it would affect its status as a gas transit country. Kremlin, however, has maintained that the decision was purely based on economic rationale. Elsewhere, the United States imposed additional sanctions against Russia over the alleged poisoning of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said that the U.S. will impose a second round of sanctions on the Russian Federation over its use of Novichok nerve agent in the August 2020 poisoning of Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny. The statement added that there would be restrictions on the permanent imports of certain Russian firearms. New and pending permit applications for the permanent importation of firearms and ammunition manufactured or located in Russia will be subject to a policy of denial. It added that there will be additional Department of Commerce export restrictions on nuclear and missile-related goods and technology pursuant to the, to the Export Control Reform Act of 2018. Over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, the U.S. also imposed additional sanctions against Russia. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said that based on a congressional report, one Russian vessel and two Russian persons involved in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will be placed under sanctions. The U.K. and U.S. also issued a joint statement on the first anniversary of Mr. Navalny's poisoning, calling on Russia to comply with the Chemical Weapons Convention. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on our Twitter handle at AIR News Alerts. Azadi ka safar every day with All India Radio from Monday the 16th of August. As part of Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav News Services Division of All India Radio brings to you the story of glorious struggle and sacrifices of freedom fighters on 100.1 FM Gold Channel in the English News Bulletins at 8.30 a.m., 2 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're listening to the World News. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on Afghanistan at the crossroads. In conversation are Yogendra Kumar, former ambassador, and Aditi Tandon, journalist. The Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan in dramatic events that unfolded over the weekend and finally leading to the collapse of Kabul on Sunday have naturally led to a major humanitarian crisis and the world is watching in shock. Apart from the humanitarian crisis, Mr. Kumar, what also remains to be seen and what is increasingly evident now is that with the return of the Taliban, maybe the geopolitical alliances in the region are going to be rewritten, are going to change. There is the Taliban, which is supported by Pakistan. China is making the right noises with the Taliban. They have been engaged with Russia. And there are a number of these factors that point towards potential realignment of forces in the region and which directly leads to a security challenge for our own country. So where on the one hand we are facing this challenge of evacuating all the Indians safely out of Afghanistan and the government has opened up a special e-visa category for such nationals today. It had already said yesterday that it will allow all non-Muslim minorities from Afghanistan to come into India. So that is one part of the challenge and the rest of it relates to the security issue. How do you see the unfolding situation? 
Uh, thank you very much. I need to mention one point here that I think uh, talking in terms of geopolitical alliances, of course, we can see the alliances kind of things emerging, but it's a little premature to talk in terms of alliances because any alliance, for it to be stable or sustainable, it requires a stable agency, a stable agent. If Afghanistan is a state of instability and uncertainty and still has yet to recover from a situation of state collapse, then perhaps how Afghanistan would really be, let us say, an agent for the geopolitical ambitions of either Pakistan or China or any other country, uh, for that matter, I think it's a little premature. So my biggest apprehension at the moment actually is that unlike 2001, when the Operation Enduring Freedom had led to the ousting of the Taliban, at that time there was unanimity as to what kind of political settlement needed to be had in Afghanistan after the ejection of the Taliban. Now there is no unanimity. So because of the fact the turnaround or change in regime which has taken place has taken place in such uncertain circumstances, I think everybody is very cautious and carefully weighing everything as to how things will develop and how they need to position themselves. And I'll give one example here straight away. I mean, one thing, of course, is, of course, Taliban certainly have sanctuary in Pakistan, could have done far more than what they have done to manage the situation better. But we also know that Taliban actually had no interest in negotiating in good faith for an intra-Afghanistan political settlement. In a way, kept on in the deceptive manner, uh, trying to divide various sort of uh, groups who are interested and then finally to capture power in Kabul in particular. So I think, and they, of course, now the mounting problem that they're facing, for example, first of all, as you have seen the video clips, I do not think any of these people have any experience of governance. First of all, we talk about political settlement, a political framework, which actually is the basis for a state formation. Now, that is not very clear at the moment. Secondly, the capacity for governance, obviously, for what you've seen, you don't see that actually manifest. The people that you see, the leadership, I mean, how you see them acting. At the same time, the because of the fact that Afghanistan actually has collapsed, despite the fact that Taliban has formally taken over the entire territory, the fact of the matter is these uh, other extremist elements, whether it's Al-Qaeda or it is or it is ISIS or it is the other terrorist elements which actually have regional or national agenda, whether it's towards China, whether it's towards Tajikistan, towards Afghanistan, towards India, towards Pakistan, towards Iran, for example, and so on and so forth, and of course the U.S., so these people still are around. That's the whole point. So, for example, in the northern Afghanistan, the military campaign which took place, it is these people actually helping the Taliban in capturing the cities. Then the other side, which you see here when you talk about any kind of governance, the Taliban have been controlling the area, let us say, when Kabul was one of the controlled rest of the area. Now, two major prisons, one is in Bagram, the other is Pule Charkhi, which are actually in the vicinity of Kabul. They actually have been high security prisons where not only Taliban prisoners have been kept, but also Al-Qaeda and other prisoners have been kept. Now, the Taliban having control over that area have actually opened the prison gates and everybody has gone out. So it shows the Taliban still have to maintain those alliances which they actually have with the terrorist elements. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, is the, the fact that now everybody is talking about instability there and because of that, the condition inside Afghanistan, talk of humanitarian situation, whether, it, as I said, migrations of people, whether it is transnational crime, or, for example, the situation of, uh, you know, refugees overflowing in uh, different territories, different neighboring countries. These are major issues, and India is facing kind of a spillover of that itself, you know. So, at the moment, as I can see, the situation is highly fluid, and again, you find something very, very unique here. In this particular case, unlike the bond process which took place, you have negotiations going on in Kabul, you have negotiations going on in Islamabad, you have negotiations going on in Doha. And all these negotiations, in a way, Taliban actually are the key factor. If they had genuine interest in making sure it's an inclusive government, then they would actually have one single negotiating process. Uh, the most striking development of the recent events and the rapid uh, manner in which Taliban captured Kabul has left everybody, you know, quite flabbergasted about the way the retreat was managed by the U.S. 
we all knew that uh, since 2014 this had to happen and the agreement was signed with the Taliban in February 2020. What happened really and who do you think is the biggest loser in this entire uh, process? Where does well, India and US stand? Where do they stand today? All right. So first, the, the process of Taliban takeover of Afghanistan as a whole. Actually, I have a different opinion on this. Because uh, I was ambassador in Tajikistan in 2000, from 2003. So actually, the Operation Enduring Frida, I was watching it very closely with Dushanbe at that time. So one thing I noticed, that is the time when I noticed for the first time that the military conflict in the Afghanistan has a different dynamic. And the dynamic actually, in a way, is a bit of mind game between military adversaries. One side knows that they have no chance of winning. They simply abandon their front line and go back and consolidate to fight another day. So in the case of 2001 operations, of course, this time it was more rapid than at that time. But at that time also, in 2001, I think sometime in November, when the mazar sharif fell in the north, then there were pockets of resistance. But the Taliban knew that their game is over. And they withdrew from the front lines right across wherever the fighting was going on. Of course, I mean, fighting went on for a while. But it was very clear to them that they have to come back. So from mazar sharif there were special flights organized by the Pakistan army to take away this ISI officers who were actually helping the Taliban fight against Northern Alliance people. And then, of course, then they withdrew and they all came actually into Pakistan. So, and then, of course, when they got the chance after two, three, four years, then they mounted the campaign again. So the point actually here is that I'm not surprised that people should be saying that, that you know, they are surprised by the speed. Once they understand the nature of the dynamic military conflict in Afghanistan, once you know that Taliban are winning the mind games so to say, then they should prepare for the worst. Another question which is uh, actually on everybody's mind is everybody who's followed the way the Taliban work knows that they do retreat to their bases, you know, in winter. And mm. isn't it surprising then to strategic experts such as yourself that the U.S. should actually withdraw at the peak of summer and hand it over, hand over the country as one city after the other fell to the Taliban at the peak of summer, they're in their full force. I think uh, you have have to also put yourself in the shoe of the U.S. president, frankly, and he gave a justification for it. He said that when we have decided, taken a decision to withdraw, then there is no point lingering on because that means there is a cost to the people are dying there, the American soldiers are dying, there, there's so much money being spent on that. So that aspect, I don't think even the U.S. anybody disagrees with that. What the people seem to be saying in the political sort of uh, opinion in the U.S. among some people basically is that the manner of withdrawal, that could have been better organized because once you know that things are just collapsing, then do not wait until last minute because last minute things collapse even at a faster rate. You know, that's the whole point. So the situation that you find that, you know, there was this chaos at the airport not been sorted out, but they could have actually started taking people out earlier. That's my point. So now we talk about India. I remember in question talking about India. Where does India stand? I think India's position in a way is not different from the position of most countries. Because we have also suffered the blowback from the, the previous phase of Afghanistan where Taliban actually were ruling the roost, so to say. But also because if, Tali if Afghanistan remains unstable as it is and different countries are trying to play their own little games there, that India is worried, as I said, because it becomes a source of instability in the region which is very close to us. And therefore, we actually will be facing a situation there. So what India actually, I think, uh, rightly doing is to build up the international consensus to tell the Taliban, convey the message to the Taliban that, listen, the times have changed. You are a poor country. You will have to govern the country at some point. And you are not fully in control of Afghanistan. The Panjshir Valley, for example, is not under their control. Certain, some of these military leaders like Dostam and Nur Atta actually have left the country. So the possibility is that they are also waiting for their time to come back and again put pressure on the Taliban in to, inside the country. So the point actually is to convey a message, strong message today that once they face the reality of governing Afghanistan, if they do not change the ways, they are only getting into a greater mess. And this mess, they will be suffering, so will uh, other countries be suffering. So that is how I think. And the, real, the reality actually is that, you know, Taliban, I mean, how much can Afghanistan isolate itself from the rest of the world? You know, that's the, the point. I get your point. Also, as the last uh, question, I would just like to ask you whether India should also take heart from the fact 
that we are not in 1990. You know, there's a lot less global acceptance for terrorism now. Also, India is now not uh, taking uh, terror attacks lying down. Also, you know, Pakistan is under watch through the Financial Action Task Force. Yes. So I think hopefully better sense will prevail in Pakistan. Yeah. They will realize that, you know, again, it's not 1991. And the strategy yes. against India is failing and they cannot succeed by having a proxy ruling Afghanistan. They'll harm themselves as they already begin to feel the heat, which actually is coming from the in the AFPAC region. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Moving on to sports. In football, Liverpool beat Burnley two goals to nil in Saturday's Premier League match. The hosts, Liverpool, dominated the match in terms of possession and the number of attempts on goal. Diego Jota opened the scoring for Liverpool, while Sadio Mane doubled the lead as Jurgen Klopp's side comfortably cruised to a win. Elsewhere, India's Amit Khatri on Saturday won the silver medal in the men's 10,000 metre race walk at the World Athletics Under 20 Championships in Nairobi. He finished with a time of 42 minutes 17.94 seconds. Amit finished behind gold winner Harrison Vanyoni of Kenya. Earlier this year, Amit had set a new national under-20 record in 10-kilometer race walking when he won the title at the 18th National Federation Cup. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Washington Post reports that vaccine resistance in the U.S. military remains strong. The Guardian writes that New York City celebrates its comeback with a concert as COVID cases rise across the U.S. Sydney Morning Herald reports police arrest 47 as anti-lockdown rally fails to attract large crowds. Himalayan Times reports NASA on Thursday agreed to temporarily halt work on $2.9 billion lunar lander contract awarded to SpaceX. And South China Morning Post reports China's anti-corruption watchdog investigates Hangzhou Communist Party boss. Kerlites all over the world celebrated Thiruvonam on Saturday, the most important day of the Onam Festival, with COVID-19 cases showing no signs of abatement. The celebrations remained highly subdued, a report. For the second consecutive year, Kerala celebrated Onam in the midst of a pandemic. The festival usually brings forth a multitude of colors and flavors, but this time the exuberance and grandeur associated with it was clearly missing. The warnings by the state health authorities made people to stay away from crowds and massive celebrations. Many confined themselves to their homes. The festivities at the Trikakra Temple in Kochi, associated with the legend of Mahabali, remained low-key. The Onam feast... A regular feature of the festival held at the temple was cancelled due to the prevailing COVID-19 situation. While celebrations remained subdued, people fervently hope that the situation will change for the better during the days ahead. Taj Mohan, AM News, Kuchi. India's Minister for Science and Technology, Dr. Jitendra Singh, said that India will add 35 more earthquake observatories by end of this year and 100 more by the year 2026. Addressing a conference on seismology in New Delhi on Saturday, the minister said that the Indian subcontinent is considered as one of the world's most disaster-prone areas in terms of earthquakes, landslides, cyclones, floods and tsunamis, and the government is taking all necessary steps to meet these challenges. He stressed upon India's commitment to support various projects of Earth's science system. To quantify the seismic hazard for better land use and urban planning and creating disaster resilient infrastructures for reducing risks and ultimately paving way to sustainable development. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. India's first COVID vaccine for children above 12 years, Zykov D, gets approval for emergency use in the country. Prime Minister Narendra Modi says Zykov D vaccine approval is a testimony to the innovative zeal of India's scientists. Sri Lanka enters day two of nationwide lockdown as government battles surge in COVID cases. External Affairs Minister of India Dr. S. Jay Shankar speaks to German counterpart Heiko Maas over the situation in Afghanistan. German Chancellor Angela Merkel meets Russian President Vladimir Putin in the backdrop of one year of Alexei Navalny's poisoning. India's Amit Khatri wins silver medal in men's 10,000 meter race walk at the World Athletics Under 20 Championships. And in football, Liverpool cruise to a 2 0 win over Burnley in the Premier League.
India is celebrating the 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan by artists from Japan. With that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.